Well, what did it look like? It's a big blaze. You've seen things on fire. A big blaze just burning down. Just burning up the whole thing. Just burning up my grandmama house, churches, and everything. They burned up everything we had. All our clothes and everything. Yeah. They burned it up. Why did they burn everything? They was mad. But you were just little children. I know. What did we care? They didn't care. They killed us. I was about eight years old. I know they killed my aunt and they killed my granddaddy. Made my granddaddy dug his hole. He didn't have but one arm, but they made him dug his own grave. And he prayed and they shot him back with him in the grave. At Rosewood. At Rosewood. In 1923, it was a riot called the Rosewood Massacre, an incident of racial violence that lasted several days in January 1923 in the predominantly African-American community of Rosewood, Florida. In the years since, some have established that as many as 200 were killed, but a, an official study in 1993 placed the death total at eight, six African American and two white. In addition, virtually every building was burned to the ground by the white mobs. Most Rosewood residents refused to fight the vigilantes, fearing repercussion that were sure to follow. But Sylvester Carey took up arms against the mobs. Carey was killed in the shootout, but not before killing two white men. And the word of the act quickly spread to the surrounding communities. Hundreds of whites joined the mob already in Rosewood, an act of systematic violence against African-American continued until January the 7th. By the time the mob had dispersed, the town had been almost totally destroyed with businesses, churches, homes, runs, or burned to the ground. Surviving residents flee with many settling in nearby Gainesville or moving to cities in the north. Although a grand jury was convened in February 1923, it found insufficient evidence to prosecute. No one was charged with the crime committed to the Rosewood residents. Rosewood, Florida massacre in 1923 was covered up. 150 to 200 people were killed and buried in mass grave. The survivors was threatened for years. In 1921, the Greenwood neighborhood commonly referred to as the Tulsa, Oklahoma Black Wall Street, was home to the black lawyer, doctors, dentists, various black-owned establishments such as banks, restaurants, and hotels. 1921, when a white mob spent 24 hours looting and burning homes and businesses, what now referred to as the Tulsa Race Massacre, it left 35 city blocks in ruins. The first black town in the United States, Fort Moses, Florida, was found in 1738. Florida governor, a Spanish settler, established after enslaved members of a black militant fighting for the Spanish, petitioned for and were granted their right to freedom. Initially, the town was made up of nearly 40 free black men and women. This included those servants under the Spanish military leadership and people who fled to Florida to escape slavery in Georgia and the Carolinas. Rosewood, Florida massacre riots. Could it happen again?
One, two, three, four. <laughs> resident of Blue Island, Illinois. Today I'm going to be reading to you the lifelong history of Ida B. Wells Barnett, and this is her story. 
Ida B. Wells Barnett was a formidable force in the battle for equality and economic parity for Blacks. Her scathing editorials denouncing lynchings and other white violence against Blacks alerted the country to the atrocities common in the post-Reconstruction South. This crusader for justice, as she was called, spent her life lecturing against discrimination and persecution, and she exhorted Blacks to use their economic power to change racist white behavior. Wells Barnett was born a slave in Mississippi in 1862 to a family with a strong faith in education. They were all emancipated by the Civil War. Her mother and father were able to use their respective skills in cooking and carpentry to provide for eight children. Then her parents and youngest brother died of yellow fever in 1878, after which the young teenager dropped out of high school to begin teaching so she could care for her siblings. Wells Barnett later moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where she lived with an aunt and continued to raise her two youngest sisters. While maintaining her teaching job, she furthered her own education in summer school at Fisk University in what turned out to be the beginning of a lifelong quest for equality. In 1884, Wells Barnett refused to accept a seat in a smoke-filled Jim Crow car and was forcefully removed from the ladies' section. She filed a successful lawsuit in the circuit court against the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad Company. But the ruling with its $500 award was overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court. This event gave her the impetus to speak of justice through other means. Her militant actions, along with some editorials she wrote that were critical of inadequate African-American schools, caused her to lose her teaching job. Wells Barnett, under the pen name Iola, launched a full-time career using her mighty pen to call the country to task for its treatment of Blacks. After editing several small Black papers, Wells Barnett became part owner of the Free Speech and Headlight, a Memphis paper. In 1892, three Black men were her friends, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and William Stewart, were lynched because their grocery business was competing with a white firm. Wells Barnett fired off a series of blistering editorials, accusing whites of using lynchings to punish financially independent African-Americans. She declared, the city of Memphis has demonstrated that neither character nor standing avails the Negro if he dares to protect himself from the white man or become his rival. There is nothing we can do about the lynching now as we are outnumbered and without arms. She called for blacks to leave the towns that refused to protect them. Many followed her advice while others staged a boycott of white establishments. In response, furious white citizens burned down her paper's press and threatened her life if she returned to the South. She was in Philadelphia at the time of the backlash and returning to Memphis was not an option. Perhaps the best kept secret of the post bellum chivalrous South is that black women, as well as black men, were being lynched. Had Wells returned, she certainly would have been killed. Wells Barnett transferred her talents to New York, continuing her angry attacks on lynching in the pages of militant journalist T. Thomas Fortune's New York Age. She published pamphlets on the lynching problem and traveled to Britain to drum up international outrage. Wells Barnett relocated to Chicago in 1893 where she published a pamphlet titled, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition, which denounced the exclusion of blacks from the acclaimed World's Fair. Two years later, she married the founder of the Chicago Conservatory newspaper, attorney Ferdinand Barnett, with the intention of settling into a quiet family life. They nurtured four children, but Wells Barnett could not turn her back on the critical social issues of the time, the oppression of American Blacks and women. 
she and Jane Addams prevented the creation of segregated schools in Chicago. Wells Barnett openly opposed Booker T. Washington's practices of accommodation, such as limiting Black education to trade courses. This tireless crusader helped form and work with many important groups, including the Ida B. Wells Club and the Negro Fellowship League. Wells Barnett was also instrumental in creating the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, and making anti-lynching legislation its focus. She may have been unable to save her three friends in Memphis from a mob, but she dedicated her life to bringing the racial holocaust to a stop. In the case of Steve Green, she personally saved him from extradition to Arkansas where a lynching probably awaited him. Wells Barnett supported existing organization for women's suffrage, but she had no problem holding those groups to proper standards of racial equality. During a march in Washington, D.C., organized by the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1913, she would not walk in the rear where Black delegates were assigned. In addition to foraging beneficial relationships with feminist groups, she assisted in founding the National Association of Colored Women, as well as the Alpha Suffrage Club for Black Women, the first suffrage organization in the nation. In 1930, Wells Barnett ran for the Illinois State Legislature, becoming one of the first women to run for political office in America. Her powerful voice was silenced on March 25, 1931, when she died of uremic poisoning. She remains a jewel in the crown of the struggle for equality. This is the story of Ida B. Wells Barnett. Welcome to Black Culture Night 2023, Neighborhood Watch Group number 37. My name is Rachelle Orozco. I have two guests here with me today, Nancy Thompson, and I have uh, uh, Domingo Vargas. Uh, Ms. Thompson is our captain. Uh, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself first? Well, I'm Nancy Thompson, and I'm the captain of the 37 Neighborhood Watch Group. I was fortunate enough in the city of Blue Island to be elected alderman and I served for eight years under our present um, um, our mayor, our former mayor, who is with us today, Domingo Vargas. I was an alderman under his uh, leadership. Um, I live here in Blue Island, been here for, gee whiz, 40 years, 40, 50 years. Both of my children were born and conceived here in the city of Blue Island. The mother of two grown sons, adult sons, Robert and Carrie Thompson. I'm a widow of a Robert Thompson. His family lived here in Blue Island. Uh, there was the first black family on the north end of Blue Island. And uh, they came here in 1923. It's when my father-in-law's father bought the place. And I married into that family. And we were we had 50 years a year. My husband died, 2009. So that's a, a, a little bit about me. <laughs> Mr. Domingo Park? Yes, again, thank you for inviting me. Oh, of course. I'm a long life resident of Blue Island, born and raised in Blue Island. Uh, my family on my mother's side arrived in Blue Island in 1914. Uh, they lived in the boxcars not too far away from where we presently live on 123rd in Vincennes, off of Vincennes. And then almost 100 years to the date, I was sworn in as mayor of the city of Blue Island. First Mexican-American mayor for the city of Blue Island. I was an alderman uh, prior to being a mayor for 20 years. 
So total uh, years of service to the community, 28 years, uh, eight years as mayor, 20 years as an alderman. And out of those 20 years as alderman, I was four years as mayor pro tem of City of Blue Island. I'm also a criminal defense attorney. I've been practicing since 1988. I have my own law firm downtown in Chicago, primarily dealing with criminal defense cases all across the country, both state and federal. And I'm privileged and honored again to be amongst both of you uh, and being residents uh, and citizens of our lovely, beautiful town, city of Blue Island. Yeah. Thank you. Well, this is the 100th historical anniversary of the Rosewood, Florida massacre, a 1923 riot. Okay, one of the things we need to clear up when people say riots, uh, everyone have a different idea what it is. The legal descript description is a violent offense against public order involving three or more people that involve violence. Like an unlawful assemble, and a lot of people, they might have, well, people have had unlawful assembles, but in contrast to an unlawful assemble, a riot involved violence. The concept is obviously broad and embraces a wide range of group conduct, from a bloody clash between picketers and strike breakers to the behavior of street corner gangs. Okay. Today, these are critical times for America and the world. We have experiencing a dramatization of, bad, of a bad dream that is now reality. We are experiencing life events we can no longer close our doors to. Could a riot like in 1923 happen again? This is not the first time or the last time black cities was erased off the map. What riot in 2016 by our government officials shamed the nation with no respect to our legal system? Anyone have the answer to that? Oh, I, are you referring to um, the era of the Trump era? Thank you. January 6th. Thank you. That, uh, that happened. Domingo, you're a lawyer. Yes. And you had to take an oath. Yes. And I'm sure Trump had to take an oath too and his followers. Uh, how did that make you feel when they raided the, the White House? You know what? It was disgusting, appalling. Mm -hmm. Again, you have elected officials who are watching, monitoring as this is going on. You had a former president and other elected officials who I would think had an idea as to what was gonna be happening and maybe through modern technologies, through social media, uh, instigated it uh, and, and pushed their people, their followers to do their dirty work. Yeah. And then they try to basically wash their hands of their guilt to say, oh, we didn't know of it. Because I remember that day, January mm -hmm. 6th, when yes. it was happening, just as if 9-11, we saw that happen in front right. of us, we saw what was going down on January 6th, almost a year ago, and everybody sat back. But again, if it was you or me, we probably wouldn't be here discussing <laughs> what we're discussing now right. if right. it hadn't been for those people. Yes, right. absolutely, absolutely. How, how did it change America since then? What have you noticed? You're in the legal, you're in the legal part of uh, United States, Island, correct? So you see more crime probably than anyone. Right. Do. Well, maybe an injustice as to disparity as to what one group of people got or did just was a slap on the hand versus other. I think as the public, the general public, put pressure on our government, our elected officials that's when they started to maybe prosecute these individuals. Mm -hmm. But if not, if America would have stayed probably with the previous president, I think they would have just swept that away, say, you know what, it happened and we're in power again and, and forget about it. We won't penalize, we won't uh, put anybody in jail. We, we fought for our freedom, the patriots, as they said. The but patriots, they weren't patriots. They were not patriots, patriots. correct. Yeah. But in their views, they were yeah. based on an ideology that they were brainwashed to believe. Yeah, absolutely. Are we safe? Are we safe? You know what? Uh, you hear people saying, given local national terrorists, that maybe they think they cover uh, their patriots, but in fact, just as well back in Germany, when Nazi Germany, how people were brainwashed, 
for patriotism, nationalism, and they started pointing fingers on certain ethnic groups or certain minorities or immigrants that they were the cause of, of their ills, it's a basically, we are repeating history again and we're not paying attention. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, did it spread more hatred, uh, Nancy Thompson? Do you think it's spread the, well, the, the change of America, their attitude, you know? Uh, we got this big dream. Uh, everyone want to go to America because all your dreams have come true. Now, what did something like this do to America? Well, America, to the people who don't live here and are trying to get here, um, this is really a, a black mark because everybody has pictured the United States of America, land of the free and home of the brave that we're noted as. But this was really a black mark on the United States of America. With all the hatred, we had people who were worried about people from other countries coming in and causing um, unlawful things to happen. But we had homegrown terrorists right, right here right. in the United States of America right. and have been here for years. But the idea of many people who want to come to the United States and still want to come, because in many countries, uh, our country is the land of freedom and opportunity, and people want to come. But now, it's just uh, really a, a problem with the word immigrant that, that our former president just wanted to put a black mark on. You didn't want immigrants to come here. But this country was built on immigrants. Right. Right. <laughs> if it were not for immigrants, we wouldn't be where we are today. But we know that the original people here were the Indians. Right. It was and everybody, everybody else is an immigrant. <laughs> yeah. You're not Native American. Yeah. Correct. That's right. Yes, that's right. true. Everybody else come from another country. That's true. So, you know, that's yeah. it. I almost said Mayor Vargas. Vargas. <laughs> uh, we still have uncounted Americans sleeping in cars, mm -hmm. tents, mm -hmm. on the street. Uh, why? I understand. I, I don't, I will help anyone. But I'm before I leave my house, I'm going to make sure my family's fed first. Correct. My family's taken care of first. Uh, what do you think the solution to this? Because I think, I think COVID helped contribute to this. I think the fact that uh, a lot of Americans are kind of like mean now. So you see a homeless person, they don't have pity for them. Right. What, what do you think? The you know what, my first encounter, real encounter of that was when I was representing people in California in the mid 90s, mm -hmm. where you started seeing groups of people in the corner sleeping in tents. And I haven't been back to California in quite some years, but now I'm seeing in entire families mm -hmm blocks upon blocks upon blocks of tent cities <laughs> in California, where before California was known as being the place for opportunity, movies, uh, glamour, success. Yeah. So that's kind of the opposite of what the American yeah. dream is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, unfortunately what I've seen, why has it happened? Uh, it could be the drug issue, mm -hmm. addictions, mental health issues, uh, whether people want to get help or not, not just the people who are in that predicament, what happens to us as a community to try to help? Let's take it even in blunt sense. Yes. You got people saying, oh, they look the other way. Uh, if they see a homeless person or a person they think who's down on, on their luck, they walk across the street or they don't even say hello, do they acknowledge it? They basically treat a person almost as if it was an animal, as a dog, okay? Mm -hmm. You got certain people who say, well, we can solve that. We'll get rid of uh, this thing so they no longer hang out there. That is not the solution, no. okay? Again, does it, is it because of maybe an opioid problem? Is it problems at home? Uh, is it personal problems? I think it's a combination of all. But again, as the uh, African saying says, it's a whole village that, yeah. that uh, educates and raises an individual right. or a child, but it's also, it's a whole village or community that has to take care of its own, whether they live in our community or not, I know a lot of places here in Blanc provide food, shelter, 
uh, and it, it's a it's both ways. The person has to be willing also to participate and want the treatment and the help and and, and the food. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't for whatever reason, whether they're humbled or or, or pride. Mm -hmm. But again, it goes back to maybe your upbringing. I think we grew up in families that said, you know what, we got to take care of our own family. Mm -hmm. But if you can, and if you can, whether you're Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, try to help yeah. your brother and sister as best as yes. you can. And don't just give them the boot. Yes. And unfortunately, Absolutely. maybe the attitude of people now, they haven't suffered as our, our families have coming up, that they don't recognize that it isn't easy. Life isn't easy. And you don't have everything given to you. And maybe that's maybe the youth now and generations now, Everything's been handed yeah, to, them, to them, and they don't have—they don't know what it is right. to suffer. Right. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And one of the things, uh, especially with uh, the black families, I think that uh, our history, you know, uh, social media, social media, and kind of wiped out, you know, what the value system is. Mm -hmm. You know, our children don't believe a lot of things that happened in the past. That Correct. They don't even believe they happened. You know. So that could be... And there's people, the not to interrupt, there's people yeah. out there who don't even believe the Holocaust happened. Yes. That, that the killing that's of the six million Jews, Jews ever happened. Yes. Or that the earth is round, that whatever. Yeah. I mean, history, yes. you're not reading it. Newer generations, again, I don't even think they sit down and read a book. It's all social media, whatever they can find on Google. They believe it or they don't believe it because it, it appears on that. They don't investigate themselves yes. if they haven't lived it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and in some areas, uh, it's still a lot of uh, people is like uh, uh, race on race crime, you could say, mm -hmm. black on black crime. Mm -hmm. You just can't just say black on black crime because there's a lot of other races now are, are having the tendency of killing their family, their neighbors, their friends. And uh, that, that bothers me too. And why do you think that's happening, Ms. Thompson? Why is it happening? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's the time. It's it's the time that we're we're living in, and it's a lot of hatred. Um, we'll go work back back to uh, past uh, president, previous mm -hmm. president. Right. He he just woke up a sleeping lion. A lot of people. Uh, that uh, hatred just seemed to burst out. And a lot of people had hatred and was within and they just kept it at a low key. <laughs> but he opened the doors for a lot of people to reveal how they really felt about family and other people. And so now it's just like um, it is an open door People are resorting to more crime than ever. Uh, more crime than ever, and it's uh, it's terrible. It's really terrible, and I feel personally so badly about how many families also suffer. You know, and being a black person and coming from the South, when I was born in South Carolina. We all, oh, I came from a family that reached out and helped everybody, no matter what, no matter what race you were, whatever. I was raised by grandparents. Yeah, you still do that in Blue Island, too. <laughs> <laughs> the tradition continues. Yeah. <laughs> to reach out and help those. And even it tells us from our Bible, you, 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 uh, Ephesians, you help your brethren and sisters. If they're down and out and you can help, you reach out and do that. That's your duty a responsibility to help mm -hmm. when you can. Domingo, what do you think part of the problem? Uh, you probably had to defend some of these You know what? Uh, yes, unfortunately, it's maybe the greed, uh, jealousies. Mm -hmm. But as uh, former Alderman Thompson mentioned, the previous administration, presidential pre uh, president, there was a lot of people who kept that low key because they didn't want to be the spotlight or, or be called the racist or other names because they didn't want the attention. Mm -hmm. The doors opened wide. If he allows it to do it, he's the president or that elected official, 
I can do it. If he can do it, yeah. he's mm -hmm. giving me the carte blanche to do what right. I want right. to do. Sexual Whether it was racism. local, yeah. yeah. state-wise, or national, or even worldwise. Mm -hmm. They think, you know, it started here, and I think you've heard stories in Brazil, the same type of ideology of the president over there. I had the same thing as Trump, yes. and they're going through the same stuff right now. Same, same thing, but they're January 6th, where they uh, uh, went into the uh, governmental palace and destroyed it. Same imitation, oh, wow. imitating yes. again. And, and it was all originated from a lie that the election was stolen. Correct, yeah. and they still and are still, still that the election yes, was stolen. stolen. <laughs> They're still believing he this. He didn't face the fact he lost. Right. No. And in fact, from what I heard this morning, he's already preparing for the 2024. Yeah. He's attending two campaigns of, of two people who are gonna be running for that. So his mentality is he's gonna continue because he has the support. And there's probably people out there, I know there's people out there who still believe in him that America has to be great again, but in fact, they're blinded that America has always yes. been great. It's yes. had its problems, mm -hmm. it's had its issues, but to them, because of their people or their way of thinking, it hasn't been great until he showed up. Okay, one of the, a couple of things I think does also had an effect on on people and and uh, uh, I, I would say society is that a lot of people are depressed, they lonesome. And then you look on social media, on TV, people with, with uh, PlayStation, uh, Apple phones, uh, all the little quirks that you could, if you have money, you could purchase. I think that I came back, this is, this is my mm -hmm. personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Ever since MTV came out with the, with the media, with the videos, uh, social media, uh, the music videos, whether it's rap, rock, mm -hmm. uh, country, and they glamorize a certain right. way of living, fast yeah. living. You don't have to work for it, we can get it for you, whether it's committing crime, doing this, they were getting a woman, her body, men, children, and we lost it. Yes. There's no more morals, morals. Yes. they're gone. They're gone. Not only here in this country, but it's the whole world yeah. is so, thinking like that. Everything goes. Yes, is acceptable, Correct. no matter what it is. Right, you know. Or it's my right to be the way I want to be. Yes, or do what I want to do. Or yes. it's the fact: why should you have it and I don't? Correct. Yeah. And you since know. you got it, I want it. Right. Or and you're I, wearing the four hundred or five hundred dollars sneakers or, or tennis shoes. Yeah. I want it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to take them for you. I'll take them. I'll take them. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all me, me, me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you? Is it okay for some people to have everything, others sleep on the street? Do you think this is an acceptable attitude, crime against blacks expected? I don't want to jump, I jumped the gun. Uh, the first question, is it okay for some to have everything and others sleep on the streets? No, absolutely not, no. As citizens, uh, responsible citizens, what are some of the things you think we should do to correct that? Again, volunteering, helping out. If you can, uh, again, I don't know if it goes to that extreme, uh, finding a shelter. I don't know if it comes to the extreme, they're gonna Need give them a place in your home, but I mean, at least <laughs> finding shelter, a place that they're not on the street, okay? Mm -hmm. Find food or uh, where they can get basic necessities. Again, if you're Christian and your your beliefs are, you know, help your brother, help your sister. Right. If you don't live that, you might, let's put this, there's a lot of people who go to church, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. church it may be. They say it, but they don't do the- They don't do they the They in work. church, but the church ain't in them. Correct. <laughs> it's all words, That's but right. they don't do the act. There's no actions, it's all words. Yeah. And I would like to uh, expound on what he would say, what the mayor is saying. Uh, remember back when the epidemic was really right. wow. Uh, the late Carol Green mm -hmm. in this town, a citizen, she was an activist, and she organized with um, two eighteen just the Blue Island Stroke, Blue Island Stroke. Right. and Mayor Mayor Vogg is here, and Rochelle and myself, the thirty seven neighborhood watch group, and other people donated. Every month, food right. 
in our services it's to hand it out. To hand it out. Yeah, we did. And and did it successfully. Correct. No questions asked. Right. They just drove in, opened the trunk. Probably more than a hundred and some families were fed. Fed. Every, every at least once a month. That's right. And they provided us staple foods for them. That's right. And we do, yeah. Reached out. Right. And, and, and helped. We need yeah. more citizens like that. We need more citizens. Don't talk to talk, walk to walk. Correct. Come out yes. and help. Right. You know, uh, join some of the, the different uh, uh, groups that we have in Blue Island to help other people. From the so, Salvation Army, the pantries, mm -hmm. uh, or again, yourself. Yeah. Hey, um, do you need help? Let me see if I can find something. Uh, let's make some phone calls. Uh, as you say, don't talk to talk. Yeah. You got to do it. Right. And that's unfortunately that in modern society, they're not doing it. There's a very a small amount of people, organizations or institutions and churches who do it. Everybody else just this, I'm going to do it. And the elected officials are very guilty of that too. Yeah. And a lot of times uh, people are called, they'll call me, they, they sometimes they call me to talk to her and I, you know, I told her she's a retired alderman and I block it. Uh, because if I can help them, I help them, otherwise I direct them right. But uh, we need more people to actually work and do it. Don't say somebody, that somebody is you. Correct. So that's yeah. somebody you have to help. When you that question comes to your mind, somebody need to do something about it. Well, step up to the plate. Lead by you know? example. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. I think, something that Alderman Thompson, yourself, Rochelle, mm -hmm. and myself, mm -hmm. is we've always led by example. Yes. We've never waited for anybody to tell us, this, uh, go do this. No, no. We shut the example, mm -hmm. and then everybody follows. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been our livelihood since yeah. day one. Yeah. It reminds me of Michael Jackson, the late Michael Jackson song, The Man in the Mirror. Yeah. Look at yourself in the mirror and see what you can do to change, to make a change. Right. And that's what we need to do. Make a change to make things better. And I want to say about the co-captain here of the bar club, she gives out food to people. She, she has this secret thing that she gets food and she gives them out to the people in the neighborhood and have them come to her house and they get bags of food mm -hmm. and, and everything. She's constantly giving out food to people all My the time. My brother worked for a food uh, factory and he loads me up. And I'll beg my neighbors, you need some food? Especially the ones who have kids. But if anyone need it, I, I have no problem with giving it. But I, I do want to uh, bring to everyone attention. You, We have two powerful people sitting at this table. You're the most powerful Hispanic or Mexican in Blue Island. Um, and uh, I have to salute you. Thank you. And you're the most powerful black woman in Blue Island. Oh, you know, and I have to you. salute you. You know, if you mention their names, people know who you're talking about, you know, because like I said, not, not a lot of people in Blue Island step up to the plate like they should or like we need them to do. And the only way we're going to uh, put a foot on some of this is that we work together and step up there and volunteer. Correct. And that's the thing. Volunteering and giving back. Yes. Giving back to your community, whether it's your block your city, your state, or your country. Right. Yes. For all of the book. And in our blog club, the 37 Neighborhood Watch Group, if we hear of a person who is ill, uh, they are terminally ill, we have in our bylaws, we give out a $25 check to that person if they're sick, uh, a one-time check. And then death in the family, we do the same thing we'll give them family $25 check from our block club. We used to make meals, but you know, that's, we're both getting a little old for that. Them pots are heavy now. <laughs> <laughs> no more homemade cooking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, when we were gathered from yes, Black Coach yes, and I, yes, yes, remember? Yes, oh, yes, man, yes. we'd have the whole spread. Yes, yeah, we did. Yes, everything. We did. Right. <laughs> Okay, today is still is still a lot of uh, well, it's sad to say, there's still a lot of uh, crime not only on blacks, but there's a lot of crime on Hispanic. Uh, our our ex uh, president, he just shocked me 
the way he uh, kind of dwelled on the Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And I said, they're not the only immigrants that come to this country. And some of the things that happened to some of them kids and family just hit me in tears. But I'm going to address this to you, Ms. Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, crime against blacks, is it expected and accepted? Do you think an acceptable attitude? Whereas you look at the news and something happened to uh, a black family or a black person, is that an expected and accepted attitude? Whereas, oh, you know, it's okay, they're black. No, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Uh, no, that definitely should not be. Um, black people, uh, from the time of slavery, I think this is a, a slave mentality. That, is that Jim Crow? Ghost Jim, hunters? Yes, it definitely is. It definitely is. And people are not as good as, as, as others. It's mm -hmm. making a division. You're black, you're not good as another person who's white or a, another race of people. You're not as good. You're at the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. And will someone just see you visually? And some have the idea they're black, so they're not deserving mm -hmm. of, of who, equal as another race of people who are not deserving. Mm -hmm. And this is an attitude from slavery. No, okay. This is a slave attitude. I mean, I think yeah. what it's also yeah. if this if you know that this person's from this block or this neighborhood, he's from that other one. They're all bad people over there. Right. They're yeah. from that other state, that other neighborhood, whatever. You They're no good. They prejudge. Yes. Yeah, the prejudice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that goes amongst the Hispanic yeah. community oh, yes. too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's Everybody. the problem. Yes. Everywhere, yes. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Jealousies again. Yes. What does he have? How come I don't have it? Well, you know what? He has it. I'm going to get it because right. I deserve it. He or she doesn't deserve it. Right. And you have many people uh, don't take the opportunities to jump on the bandwagon when there's something to improve your life, mm -hmm. your educational law background. There's some people just don't take advantage of it. And they're angry because you did. And they didn't. And they didn't. Yeah. That's right. They did not. Or they want it the easy way. Fast money. Yeah. Everything without having to sweat it out. Yeah, that's they right. They want it right now when people have been 10 years, 15 years, 20 years to get to where they are. Right. They want it immediately right. compensated and it doesn't work that way. Even no, education. That's the yes. thing with education. Yes. There's, there's, yeah, a, there's a good that's, example. That's the big thing. Yeah, and see, right. it, it's not easy for anyone. I'm sure it wasn't easy for oh, law no. school. Uh -huh. You know, when I was in college, I used to set up and dream. Most of the time, I would have two part-time jobs and going to college full time. Mm -hmm. And I used to set up sometimes. I wonder how it feels just to go to go to work and don't have to go to school and do homework. I said, I wonder how that feels. But you know, that I was in my uh, or late just go teens. to or just go to school and not having to work because yeah. everybody's been paid for. Well, well I, I was poor. I knew yeah. that, yeah. so I knew yeah. that was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I said, well, eventually I'm gonna. Uh, be able to go to work and then I don't have to worry about school and, and tests and stuff. And I used to sit up and dream about that when I was in between L's and buses. But yes. um, it's hard work. No one's going to give it to you. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, a person who, especially like you, a lawyer, I bet you spend a many days up. Oh, there would be a lot of midnight oils, two, three in the morning, just to catch up, to get ready for an exam. Because again, there was disparities maybe a knowledge or culture or whatever, you thought, you know what, they might have an upper hand on certain things that they're used to. Right. I have to catch up in order to figure right. out right. because they didn't come naturally. Right, right. And then some things, because I was born in the city, uh, a, lot, a, a lot of things educational-wise I wasn't exposed to. Mm -hmm. So when I went to college, sometimes I would have to have two, three, four extra books I would have to buy just to catch up to where everyone else was. Correct. Or whatever I had to do, I did. And I think the other thing that also, if you had siblings that had already went through the system, the they assisted. But if you weren't, like myself, mm -hmm. it was a new experience, not only for the parents, but for me. Well, for you. So, you so, so now what first. do we do? How do we do financial aid? Yeah. How do we prepare for this exam? Mm -hmm. uh, what is an LSAT? What is the ACT, SAT? Mm -hmm. Those were all new boundaries. Mm -hmm. I have 30 uh, first cousins the grandkids. And uh, I'm not the oldest, but I was the first one that went to college and I graduated. And when I did that, 
the grandkids that was older than me started going to school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because our families was telling us, oh, just get you a good job and work and that's the rest all you of need. your life. That's all you need. Right. My grandfather said, you're working too hard in the books. You know, he said, life's not about that. But that's that's what he believed. That was the, you know, that was the mentality yeah, back then. Right. You, as long as you get a a, a union job or right. a, a, a you know a nine to five job yeah. paid well, uh, you get your benefits. That was your livelihood. Yeah. Right. You were satisfied with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, during the time in, in the South where I came from and the Jim Crow law segregation, I have one experience that I shall never forget. Um, I would walk to school, we had a country school, and it was about two miles from where we really live. And the black kids walked on a dirt road to get to this school. The white kids had a school bus that took them to school. And they had, many times we were walking to school, they would open the bus windows and spit on us walking to school, the black kids, but there were no bus service for us. It was only for white kids. Mm -hmm. And I remember that and I said, well, I'm gonna do better. I was living with my grandparents at the time. Then when I came to Illinois, my mom, and then went to Morgan Park High School. Well, then everything just changed for me. And it was hard, and now uh, I'm sure but all we're sitting here today talking about our experiences, you know, educational-wise, to go on to school and to do better. And that was, that was the goal that was set in my head, that I, I'm going to make this and I'm going to, to do better. And thank God it did happen, you know. But to get back to our, our main thing, why do you why do black Americans fear the police as much as criminals? Uh, we have a and it not not just uh, I just can't say black because I came to court one time. Mm -hmm. We had an incident in Blue Island, and it looked like I always knew that it was like fifty percent Hispanic in Blue Island. That day was proof. It was so many Hispanics. It covered uh, Vermont, the whole street, all inside the uh, the courtroom. I went back home and got my husband. I said, you got to see this. Okay. So, uh, obviously, it was some things going on that the average citizen didn't know about. Like, a lot of Hispanics was being harassed. They were being robbed, uh, not just by by criminals, but uh, from my understanding from that, that court day, they were being robbed by policemen. So I'm giving this question to both of you. Uh, I know that our people have different reasons for being afraid of the police, and we're gonna let Vargas go first. Let me start this way. Culturally, it's put back in Mexico, the police, let's put this way, is not a profession that anybody wants to have yeah. because of the, the briberies, the scandals, the brutalities, so back, it already you already come in, in a bad in a bad way okay, okay? so okay. then when yeah, they see bad. them here they don't know the language I mean the majority of them don't know the language or a good part of them mm -hmm. so that's you know they're scared they see a person in uniform and again if they're undocumented that's another thing that they're scared of mm -hmm. that they're going to be deported whether to their uh, native country so again the language the lack of knowledge of the customs um, had contributes to the to the fear of police or authority people in authoritative uh, positions um and again what they've seen happen to their to their siblings their children but again it goes then to why were the police call us for example maybe you got the sibling involved in gang stuff mm -hmm. so they now they have a different mentality because the police are always hounding them or always checking up on them, or they're always involved. So it's a two-way street. You can you can see both sides of it. Mm -hmm. One of them maybe because they've been always involved in crime-ridden things, and that and the police are always around because they're arresting family members left and right because the family members are in trouble. Mm -hmm. The law-abiding ones are fearful because they don't want to say anything because they fear that either they're going to be deported 
or they're going to be thrown in jail and they don't know the language and they don't know, you know, they fear the, the unknown. Mm -hmm. Or personal experiences too, whether they've been beaten by anybody in authority, physically, mentally, or psychologically. Yes, yes. And when he comes down to African American, this is a, is a slave mentality that when a runaway slave left the master and they were hunted down, the first and brought back, that slave was beaten. Those people who brought them back was similar to a policeman, as you may say, as a policeman is today. They were caught and brought back mm -hmm. and punished. And this is a, a fear, a natural fear from black people from slavery. Mm -hmm. They have this fear against someone who has more power or authority over them and they fear them and the police today they they instill fear we know there are certain areas of town where drugs and whatever prostitution is going on well they're watching those areas all the time but there are some innocent people who are victimized and they are brutalized and, and they're killed by policemen and it shouldn't be. It should not be. Now, both of you, we've we've talked about this before. We talked about it, uh, uh, Mr. Vargas, when you were mayor. Okay, uh, how do we protect families, cities, if we have a riot, disaster, or crime in our city? I know what you did as a mayor. Yes. Now, uh, you want to? Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. So I think any person in a position of leadership should be prepared or have some kind of a plan in case something should happen, what he or she's gonna be doing. What we saw not that long ago is again, blood is we call it the island, okay? So when it start, starts- Okay, okay. <laughs> Why do they call it an island? Well, uh, not to cut you off. No, no, the island because of various <laughs> reasons. Because again, at one time they say it was an island in Lake Michigan and also was by, surrounded by bodies of water. But again, let's put it this way uh, geographically, city on the hill, yeah. mm -hmm. in looking down, it's, it looks, it's an island, okay? From, from, we're the highest point, I think, in Cook County. Mm -hmm. We're on a plateau. If you see, you're going down to 87th Street, you're going down to Cal Park, you're going down towards Elsip and you're going down towards uh, Dixmore and Robbins. So when we had that incident with the social unrest, whether they were black, Hispanic, white, coming towards Blue Island, my main thing is, listen, we're gonna have to make Blue Island an island, fortify it so you don't allow people in. And that's what we did. Yeah. We blocked the major streets. We had a lot of assistance from other people where we blocked the streets and they couldn't get in. But you gotta be ready for all consequences. Um, this could take all night, so we're going to have to kind of cut this short. Uh, give me some of, some of the uh, things that you think a person could do individually as far as Ms. Thompson to uh, protect their city, protect our, your home, your home, your city. Oh, safety from your home? Right. Security? I'll say home security. Yeah. Okay. What, would you, what did you do? Well, personally, I looked at what I did. Well, I always had a alarm on my house that was connected with the fire department and the police department. Mm -hmm. If my alarm should happen to go off, mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm always, I was called, or either police would come to my house to mm -hmm. check on me. Right. Now, it could be because of my age, I'm an old senior citizen. Mm -hmm. And many people in town, believe it or not, they watch out for me. <laughs> when we know what you're doing, we know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> they got to check on me because I'm in the house with my little dog, Bruno, and, and they will check on me. Mm -hmm. I had security lights put on my home mm -hmm. by a neighbor in the, in, the, in the neighborhood to secure my home. And then dot locks on your doors mm -hmm. or whatever. That's what we, what I did personally. And I think what me. was good for us, again, or groups like yourself, neighborhood watch groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The eyes and ears of your community where each one protects each other. If you see a stranger, you would call the authorities, call yourself, hey, do you know somebody's there? Is he a family relative? Why is somebody in the backyard? 
why are they going through your window? That's the gist That's of the neighborhood right. watch groups, and you're a good example as to why nothing really happened recently mm -hmm. in that area because of everybody working as one unit to protect each other. And when we use the term, with, uh, you see something, say something. Something, correct. Yeah. Let someone know. If uh -oh. there's a stranger in the neighborhood, you see somebody walking down the street, looking all around and, and on the phone, mm -hmm. whatever, and they may walk by your house two, three times, or it's time for you to call police to find out what's going on. Correct. You know, you're the police, you're the eyes of your neighborhood, you know, and well, to keep it the way you want it to be. We appreciate you guys being our leaders, and I hope you stay strong. And uh, we're gonna have to pull some younger people in so that uh, we'll always have people to represent us, okay? Uh, as a country, in closing, as a country, we have to own up to all of our history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. One of the most important reasons for society to remember history is so that the bad and the ugly will not repeat itself. A true American look at the world with their eyes wide open. They stand up for justice for all. Our children deserve the truth. A child who does not know their past has a hard time seeing their future. For our children, I pray we use our history as a foundation for a better future. I want to thank all of my guests in the city of Blue Island for supporting us all these years. And uh, Blue Island Public Library, the Mayor Fred Bellotto, Executive Lawyer Domingo Vargas, and of course our Captain. And thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you. And we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for being you. the person that you are and the leader that you are in our neighborhood and what you contribute to us every day. We appreciate you, Rachelle, and we love you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Anna Wassenaar, Director of Blue Island Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us as we celebrate Black history and culture and remember those who have struggled for justice in this country. The library is proud to be a longtime host for the Neighborhood Watch Group number 37's Black History and Culture Night, and we thank you for joining us for this program. The library serves as a cultural center for Blue Island residents, and celebrating and informing of Black history and culture with our patrons is something we strive to accomplish year-round. Residents are able to access collections and programs that celebrate Black lives and their contributions. The library is proud to serve and represent the needs of the Black residents of Blue Island. Blue Island Library strives to tailor our services to patrons and offers many community spaces for citizens to take advantage of. A private study room and recording studio is available for reservation. Conference and meeting rooms are available for community use, and our newly renovated maker space is open, hosting after-school programming, children's literacy programming, and craft or STEAM programs for all ages. Blue Island has long been a destination for immigrants from Mexico and Latin America, and the library provides exceptional services for a significant population of native Spanish speakers in our community. The library maintains a Spanish language materials collection from young children up to adults, including audiobooks and downloadable materials. Our Spanish language outreach department features a variety of programs for these constituents. Along with ESL classes, Spanish language and outreach shares literacy programs and events in Spanish, bilingual story times, arts and crafts workshops, and cultural celebrations such as Children's Day and Day of the Dead celebrations. Our circulation staff will be pleased to set up library cards for any Blue Island resident to get them started with all that the library has to offer. The library has gone fine free in 2023, offering fine forgiveness for all books and magazines checked out. Adult and Teen Services curate a library of things, allowing patrons to check out for circulation items that they may not wish to purchase on their own. For example, the library of things has items such as an overhead projector, a specialty baking pan, or a ukulele. The Library of Things is an eclectic collection that provides opportunities to try things out and save people money. Also among the adult and teen services collection are board games and an extensive collection of graphic novels for teens and adults. Adult Services offers a wide array of electronic databases for research, such as Novelist for reading recommendations or Ancestry.com to research your family's history and genealogy. Adult Services Department also has public computers for quick internet searches and business printing, a scanner, a copy machine, and also officers, fax, and notary services. Adult and teen services staff are happy to, to assist with all your reference and computer assistance needs. The Adult and Teen Services Department offers many culturally enriching and educational programs and activities, including local history, author visits, arts workshops, and programming with partner organizations such as the Park District and Chamber of Commerce. Our technology annex provides one-on-one -on -one assistance with a variety of technology services. Patrons may take advantage of expensive software packages such as Adobe products for digital design work or Pro Tools for music production. Technology Annex also features a professional recording studio, which doubles as a private study room for patrons needing a quiet place to study or conduct business. Technology Annex staff are happy to assist patrons with a digital memory preservation station, keep in touch tablets, a brand new 3D printer, a brand new laser engraver, professional poster printing, and a variety of technology troubleshooting expertise. Tech Annex staff offer job training classes, such as Microsoft Office Training and Google Suite, and assist with library technology. And coming this spring, Tech Annex will host STEAM exhibits from the American Library Association's STEAM Equity Grant, intended to bring technology education and experiences to teens and tweens in Blue Island. Our Children's Services Department features a wide range of current and award-winning children's literature and literacy materials. Children's Services staff offer arts and crafts activities for families and young children, along with interactive story times in person and online. The library tot spot is a fun indoor space to visit with toys and manipulatives for young children. Children's Services offers access to technology for students working on homework, research projects, or gaming. Visit us at blueislandlibrary.org and social media for updates on programs, events, and collections curated by professional librarians just for you. Join a book club, work with the friends of the library, and please visit us to participate in all the civic amenities available to you at Blue Island Public Library.
Hello, I'm Fred Bellato, proud mayor for the city of Blue Island. I want to thank our hosts, the Blue Island Public Library and Rachelle Orozco, who I've been told has been helping run this event for the last 23 years. As the son of Blue Island, and now as mayor, there are many reasons I am proud of my hometown, but chief among them is that we are a diverse and welcoming community, and there's great strength in that diversity. This year, we unveiled a new city steel, seal with a new motto, diversity and prosperity. This reflects our goal as mayor and the city to ensure that this city is always seen as an example of people of all races coming together and forming a prosperous community. Also this year, as part of what we plan to be an annual tradition, Blue Island will begin a spotlight feature on our webpage to highlight contributions of the many African Americans who work for the city of Blue Island who put in the effort every day in all our departments, from police and fire to public works, to keep our city moving and running. It's time we give them some praise. I wish a very safe and joyous Black History Month on every resident in Blue Island. I look forward to celebrating with all of you, honoring the contributions and achievements of African Americans in Blue Island and abroad. We need to recall the solemn struggles within the Black community and remember that work is still remains before we can say we've achieved Dr. King's dream. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for joining us today. I also want to thank the mayor of Blue Island, uh, Blue Island Public Library, all of the volunteers who helped us celebrate Black History Month. Riots, disaster, crime. How do we protect our families and city? Immediately, you should report all crimes and gunfire to local police. Report crimes and shooting to city officials and local news station. Talk to your children and your family about the crime in, in the area. Keep emergency log telephone logs on the refrigerator with the above numbers. You might have to text if lines are too busy. Have an escape plan and a bug out plan for your home and family. Our watch group has a disaster plan in writing on what to do. On behalf of neighborhood watch group number 37, thank you for joining us and have a good evening.